know me, I'm Dorothy Fairburn, I'm the CLA's Director for the North Region, and I'm chairing this session today. So basically, as many of you know, DEFRA has published its Agricultural Transition Plan. It sets out the government's plan for the new agricultural policy in England. And it builds in many ways on work the CLA did oh, over 10 years ago now, I should think, on, on public money for public goods. And that's been translated into the Environmental Land Management Scheme. We think this is going to be a world leading policy and have significant potential for, for all our sector. However, the transition to the new scheme will be challenging and we need clarity in this area. We've been uh, engaging closely with DEFRA on your behalf. And today we are lucky to have with us our own expert, uh, CLA's uh, Susan Twining, together with um, a senior DEFRA representative, Henry Lucen gore I should remind you before we start that this uh, event is going to be recorded uh, so that people can listen to it later if they need to. So the format of the events this afternoon is that we will start with a, a quick poll and that will be followed by our two speakers. If you want to ask questions, uh, please do so by typing into the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. You'll see it says Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If you click on there, you can type in a question. At the end of uh, this afternoon's session, we'll try and have dealt with as many questions as possible. We, as an experiment, we're trying to get you to put a heading on the top of your question so we can try and lump together the questions and deal with as many as possible. Uh, but we'll see how we get on with that idea. So uh, let's make a start and let's have our first poll. Now, this is my first blip with the technology because I can't see the results of the poll. Are they coming up? Can anyone else see them? All right. Yep. So you can see uh, no is just slightly the majority. So let's hope that during the course of this afternoon's session, uh, you will be prompted to think about ways you can, can rectify that situation. So I think now it's my pleasure to hand you over to Henry Lucen gore who will uh, present uh, and then hand over to Susan Twining. Thank you. Uh, good day. I think it's good afternoon, isn't it? Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. I think I'm just waiting to take control of the slides uh, so I can take you through it. I've been told that uh, people want the, to go through the slides fairly fast to give more time for question and answers and particularly go through this sort of big picture overview uh, fairly swiftly um, as people are sort of aware of that to get into the some of the particularities. Um, oh, I can control. So let's see. Oh, great. Okay, so here we go. Um, <clears throat> this is meant to take 15 minutes. We'll see how we go. Um, so yeah, the overview of the agriculture transition, transition changes direct payments, obviously BPS reducing, uh, environmentally sustainable farming, which is really the uh, ELS, 
uh, transition support, sustainability, productivity, other elements, um, change to regulation enforcement, uh, self in, uh, um, obvious, and then last engagement and communication. Uh, so um, this is the sort of the broad picture. And obviously there are a range of objectives um, we want, the government wants to achieve. And the transition period is 2021 to 27. So uh, that, those are sort of key dates. Um, and key sort of themes, uh, less top-down rule setting, needless bureaucracy and less strict enforcement, more collaborative design, flexibility, frequent and useful change, genuine support for farmers. Uh, so uh, hopefully that will be uh, a, a positive message and I'm involved in a co-design scheme and certainly it's, it's, so far it's, it's very positive. Um, so key principles that this is the co-design and we can talk a bit more about what co-design co means um, and supporting people to do the right things. Um, and trust, obviously, a key element. Clear and simple, uh, obviously, I'm sure people will uh, want that. Fair and reasonable, can't say anything wrong with that. And things working for you and focusing on what we all want to achieve. So um, those principles, obviously, core to what we're trying to achieve, your judgment as to how well we do. Um, so the changes to the direct payments, quite a lot of detail there. Um, obviously slowly going down. Uh, you can see those in the in the plan and work out which affect you and how. Notice the bigger farmers have the steeper drop earlier. Um, simplification of rules. Um, so um, those are key sort of elements. Um, changes to direct payments. Uh, Delinking. Um, so that's removal of the, the link to the requirement to farm the land uh, by 2024, um, uh, with a potential for a one-off lump sum payment. Uh, so all that to, to be developed through further consultation. ELM, um, so rewards for various types of um, better management, uh, environmental regeneration, and so on. Um, Three components. Uh, so the immediate one on the for in individual farmers, and then the wider area one for what's called local nature, and then the really big scale landscape. And so, and obviously the the ambitious and scope at those different levels are are uh, get broader the, the the wider you go, and of course collaboration becomes crucial once you go beyond payments to individual farmers. Um, so ELM, the launch of the national pilot in 2021 um, with actual core elements available in 2022 of the FSI with the full thing going in 2024. So quite a, a big theme here is piloting, testing, learning, uh, co-designing um, and so on. Um, the countryside stewardship uh, to stay in place until the ELM is uh, is all out there. Um, so, uh, but so new applications until 2023 and that going on. So this is all about sort of slowly reducing one set of rules, uh, um, grants, etc., and uh, introducing gradually the others, the new ones. Um, various woodland creation incentives to remain in place. Um, and then the pilot of a new tree health scheme in 2021 with the full scheme again in 2024. So again, a new um, uh, scheme with support for felling and treatment of diseased trees and restocking following felling. Um, farming in protected landscapes um, from 2021 support through uh, areas of outstanding natural beauty and natural parks. Um, transition support and sustainability productivity. Here we're into a sort of different space outside the ELM and a number of different uh, schemes. Uh, farming investment fund, which is largely about new equipment, technology and so forth. Farm resilience, mainly about advice and support through this difficult time of transitioning from one system to another. 
um, animal health and welfare. Obviously that's about keeping uh, our standards high. Innovation, research and development. Key theme there is more, again, working with farmers, more links between the, the research element and actually the people who do it. Uh, slurry investment, obviously a key issue uh, of support there. And then new entrant support, which is the particular bit that I'm working on and know most about. Um, so I might say uh, a little bit about new entrant support. Uh, we can talk more. I mean, key ideas there is getting fresh blood, fresh ideas, um, and supporting them to be able to access land, finance, accommodation through a, a, a co-designed approach to um, support learning, uh, et cetera, uh, over a period, and trying to link that to a broader uh, system change uh, at a local level. And we've started a co-design process there, uh, working with a diverse set of people, um, people who have land, uh, who already support new entrants and actual new entrants uh, and will be new entrants um, who know uh, more about what they might need. And we'll be going out much more widely uh, on the new entrant scheme uh, to um, co-design that over the next six months or so. Uh, so changes to regulation enforcement, um, improvements to cross compliance, new regulatory approaches implemented in 2024. So you see a theme there, 2024 being a big year uh, in, the, in the, the journey, if you like, from 2021 to 2027. Um, and substantial engagement communications. Um, uh, we will have stakeholder workshops, working with farm organizations, obviously like CLA, uh, pilots, obviously key consultations. So keep in touch um, and uh, with the E alert, the alert, and uh, you'll be kept in touch with all the opportunities to co-design, co-create, uh, pilot, test uh, this, uh, these new schemes. How have I done? I think roughly 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, there's some more detailed um, um, actual material. So with that, I'll hand on to Susan Twining. Thank you, Henry. Um, thank you. It's an excellent run through um, of the headlines of the forthcoming policy changes. Um, there's clearly a, a lot of information to digest and uh, to do that um, in 10 minutes or 15 minutes is, is quite an achievement. Um, there is more information and while I hope you may have already looked at the DEFRA documentation, I would urge you to do that. Um, they're available on the .gov website and it's well worth having a more detailed look at those. I would also recommend having a look at the CLA members briefing, which is available on the website. That provides a really succinct overview of the changes and our analysis on it as well. So I think it's clear from what Henry said that this is a process of change rather than just a single point change. And I think it's important to realize that we've got a lot of work to do. There has been a lot of work done on the policies up to date, but there's more work to do in the development stage and CLA are involved at all those. I think it's important to understand, it's important to have an, an understanding of the areas that are of interest to you and then keep up to date with those developments. And has, as Henry has said, there are links to the DEFRA document to sign up in the DEFRA documents to sign up for an email alert when new information is available. And we'll also be publishing any key documents and advice on the CLA website and in our weekly e-news when that becomes available. Now, I don't want to repeat what Henry has just run through, but what I do want to do is take a closer look at some of the areas. Firstly, I'm going to have a look at the realities of the cuts in direct payments, which is something that, that will have the most immediate and major impact on many businesses. And then I'm just going to consider some of the steps that businesses might want to think about to, to get prepared for the changes. Just in reflection of the, the poll at the beginning, um, where 50, well, 54% hadn't have not um, made any plans for replacing BPS. That might, might seem, I don't know whether that seems good or bad, it's really difficult to know, but it, what it is is very typical. We've run a number of these webinars already um, and it's a fairly typical response. It's roughly 50-50 of those who have and haven't made plans. But I think it's very important to uh, gather as much information as possible and start to think about the future. So um, I just before we go on to that one, I was just wanting to reiterate what Dorothy said about the questions. 
Um, please, if you have got a question, just put a little heading in at the front of the, the question about what it's about so that we can, Dorothy can then group them up and ask them at the same time so that we're not jumping all over the place during questions. There are some suggested headings that you might want to want to ask, but of course, feel free to ask, put your own heading on it as well. So um, back to the briefing, Tim has set out, oh, sorry, Tim, Henry has set out the cuts um, each year, but because it's so important, I thought it was worth reviewing those in more detail. So for many farmers, the most significant change will be the cuts in the basic payment scheme. These payments are going to be phased out over the next seven years with the final payment in 2027. So in 2021, DEFRA is applying progressive cuts. That means there will be higher cuts for those with the, with the, with the larger payments. And then in 2022, 23 and 24, applicants will have a fifth, an additional 15% cut each year. And that will be the same whatever level of receipt that you're getting for BPS. And so by 2024, all recipients will have had at least a 50% cut in payments. And obviously for the larger recipients, the cuts are much larger. So I've set out some examples here for different rates of current BPS. And you will see that in 2021, as I said before, the cuts are lower for those with lower risk, those in, for uh, under 30,000, the cut is just 5% in the first year. And then for the larger recipients, the cuts are, are much larger. But because the cuts are the same for the remaining period, it does mean that those cuts soon um, increase over that period to the high, the 50, at least 50% 50 cut by 2024. Looking at it another way, just taking a, an example of a 10,000 pound recipient, by 2024, that will be cut by 50%, although the cut in the first year is relatively minor. It's only a 500 pound cut in the first year, but it still gets to 50% by 2024. If you're at the other end of the scale, we're taking a 160,000 pound current recipient, the cuts in the first year will be 16%, but by 2024, it will be 61%, and that will be a payment of 62,000 rather than the 160,000. So none of these are insignificant sums for any business, whatever the size or makeup. But what we do know is that the that businesses that are more reliant on farming and in sectors such as commodity cereals and grazing livestock are more like are likely to be more affected by those changes where they haven't got other other diversifications to help smooth out some of these changes. And we do know that across all sectors, only 25 percent of farming enterprises are profitable without direct payment. And that's irrespective of size, that 25% that, that includes all sizes. It's not necessarily a, a large versus small uh, um, statistic. I think it just underlines the point that there is, that there needs to be, uh, we need to look seriously at the, the farming businesses and the, and the profitability of them. So DEFRA has produced an impact assessment in 20, 2019 called the DEFRA Evidence Compendium. It's actually, it's a great document if, you, if you've got time to have a look at it. it. It's rammed full of data on all sorts of things about imports, exports, farm sizes, farm types, um, and it's got a lot of, lot of data. And it does have an analysis on the impacts of the changes and the removal of direct payments. But it, it's worth thinking that this data, the, the analysis is based on survey data from the Farm Business Survey and is averaged for different farm types and farm sizes and different tenures. So there really isn't a shortcut to looking at the impacts on your own business. The figures are challenging and making it, which is making it even more important that you take stock now and make plans to address the cuts for the business and look at other opportunities. It's worth noting that about these changes and cuts in direct payment, the CLA had advocated a delay in the start to these cuts in BPS so that it's better aligned with the introduction of the new ELM, Environmental Land Management Scheme, in 2024. And also, um, it, it aligned more with the, what's happening in some of the devolved nations in Scotland and Wales. But we also advocated that there should be shallow cuts in the early years with no more than a 25% cut by 2024. So you will see that that hasn't happened, but um, what the government has done instead is put in other schemes to try and smooth out and help the transition in these, this early part. So I'm gonna have a look at those in a bit more detail. 
So Henry mentioned some of these schemes as well. Um, I think I'm starting with the Farm Resilience Programme. This is a programme that has been piloted over the last 12 months, although it was there were some disruptions to that piloting because of COVID. And some of you may have been involved in them because there's a couple of the pilots were based up in the north. Um, that programme is the plan is that that programme will be extended and will be available probably from July onwards this year and will run initially for um, a, phase, a first phase for 10 months and then there'll be a further phase after that and that will provide advice and guidance and support one-to-one -one advice in some cases um, to businesses who are wanting to examine their business and look at what their options are and understand what the impacts of the program will be. It will be limited, it's not going to be available to everybody but it will be available to some, some businesses who qualify. The second one is the Sustainable Farming Incentive. Now, this is actually part of the new Environmental Land Management Scheme that DEFRA is bringing, is, is introducing early or introducing elements of it in 2022, which is why it's called Sustain SFI 2022, so that it will help smooth the transition and help to uh, help businesses adjust to the cuts in direct payments. We, we know that this, it is rapidly being developed at the moment and will be piloted early Early, later on this year, it will be starting into the pilot scheme and we'll have a lot more detail of that from, from February onward. The Farming Investment Fund is a new grant scheme. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be run in a very similar way to the old countryside productivity scheme with a small, small grant scheme and a larger grant scheme. And the details of that, again, are rapidly in development at, moment, at the moment and will be announced later this year. It's expected that funding for that probably won't be available until at least midway through this year or in the second half of this year. But it certainly gives time for people to think about what they might want to invest in to help improve their productivity and farming profitability and think about what they might want to apply for within that fund. And then finally, there's Countryside Stewardship, which is an existing scheme, as you know, and it will still be available. It's going to be available for new applicants and renewals right up until 2023. And it's actually a really it's worth having another look at. It has been simplified. For those of you who have heard all your bad news stories, payment rates are much better. There's been a lot of simplification and there's actually, it's, it's a good way of getting, if you haven't been in countryside stewardship already, it's an excellent way to get more, uh, get started in, in the way to, to then get into ELMS, the full environmental land management scheme in 2024. Aside from that, there's also the new entrance scheme that Henry has already mentioned and the, the delinking that will be coming in from 2024, uh, where payments will be separated from the need to continue to farm alongside potentially a lump sum exit scheme where, where farmers who are wishing to leave the industry will be able to take their remaining payments all in one lump. Now that's going to be consulted on in the next, um, next few months, we understand, and with the details of that, and we can talk about that more if there's any specific questions on it. So that's, that's the, the sort of the shape of the the transition the programs that are avail available from uh, through the agricultural transition plan. Um, the environment the flagship of that is the environmental land management scheme, and as Henry said, all most of that will be coming available in full from twenty twenty four. But in the short term, there are a number of elm test and trials which some of you may have been involved in, and the CLA has run two, and we're we're hopefully going to extend at least one of those. Then we're moving into the pilot phase. Um, and then the early introduction of the of the sustainable farming initiative incentive, sorry. But outside the uh, the agriculture transition plan programs, there's also the UK Share Prosperity Fund. This will be a national program that is going to replace the European structural funds and some aspects of the common agricultural policy that were delivered through the rural development program. So you might know those as leader or the growth program. And the UK Share Prosperity Fund will, we think is going to be available from 2022. And that will that will help with things like diversification and investment in um, other in in non-farming businesses as well as some on farming. So there's a lot happening in the policy. We're all driven by the Agriculture Act, but also the Environment Act and the Climate Change Act. Um, and there's any number of strategies and policies that are coming out um, in the next year. We've already had quite a few last year and there's more coming through this year. Uh, the food strategy, tree strategy and other, uh, other reviews. So alongside that, we've got the end of Brexit and the, the, the differing trade agreements. And we've got the, the as yet, unknown impacts of the 
the hit that the economy has taken because of COVID-19. So there's a lot changing, but I don't think that necessarily stops looking at your own business and what might happen. And while the policy aspects are really important to understand what, what's changing and how it impacts on your business, it can't, the policy side isn't going to be the only answer to your business. I think it's worth having a look at the wider opportunities, how you might change your farming system, looking at new crops, whether you can add value, looking at novel systems, or looking at collaboration, doing things differently um, with your machinery and labour, and then also the opportunities for technology. There are also new mar markets under natural capital or the private sector environmental markets. Um, these are things like selling your carbon or biodiversity net gain, which is going to be mandated through the Environment Bill, uh, the Environment Act, and will mean that any de housing developers will need to offset any impact they have on biodiversity, which may lead to opportunities for landowners. There are also, through the climate change drive and the net zero drive, there will be opportunities through clean energy and carbon sequestration. So that might look that might include energy crops or trees and renewable energy. And of course, there's diversification of um, on the farm, but also off farm work that may be may be the right road for for some. I think I mentioned trees and I just wanted to take a slight aside and just note that despite the titles of the DEFRA documents about the Agriculture Transition Plan and the Farming Investment Fund, there is actually quite a lot in in the plan for forestry and woodland. Uh, trees are part of the environmental land management scheme at all and all components, if, including the sustainable farming incentive, and trees will be part of that. And the the grant scheme, the farming investment fund, also covers farming, uh, forestry, and woodland. So there is quite a lot there as well. So um, in summary, so that we can get on to the questions, it is clear that we can no longer rely on the direct direct payment type of income, and we. You know, taking time out to look at the impacts on your own business is essential. In England, direct payments are going to be cut from 2021. That's this year. So it will be the, the payment that you'll be expecting applying for in May and expecting in uh, December will be the first one that will be cut. And bear in mind that ELM, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, is only going to be fully available in 2024. So looking at some of these other opportunities in the short term is essential. The other, pro the other issue is that funding levels are only guaranteed until the end of this parliament in 2024, when there will be a general election or when the next general election is planned. So it's something that we're very acu we're acutely aware of that beyond that, there needs to be, we need to be arguing and demonstrating that this is good value for money um, for continuing to fund the, the, the uh, environmental land management scheme and these other programmes. So actions now ensure that the core business is sound without direct payments. Be ready to look for opportunities from policies and other market opportunities and be ready for this change as few businesses are going to be untouched. CLA is here to help. Uh, we provide advice through the Land and Business magazine, telephone advice from the regional and national teams and we have a number of guidance notes such as nat natural capital and environmental markets. That's actually a series of three really good, good guidance notes. There's the rural asset management plan to help look at what you've got and how you might be able to use that and carbon accounting among a whole list of others. And then obviously on the policy development and lobbying side, we will continue to work with DEFRA and other organisations to shape the future and help achieve the change that is right for our members. Thank you. I'll hand back to Dorothy. Well, Henry and Susan, that was uh, a phenomenal gallop through the subject. I, I, I hope those listening weren't actually eating their lunch because I fear they might have indigestion after all that. <laughs> uh, so we've, we've got quite a few questions coming in. And so what we'll do is I'll ask the questions and try and link together those that are relevant and we'll see how many we get through. Okay. So uh, our first one was uh, Peter Meadows about entitlements and he wonders what future they had and if their value will drop to zero over the next eight years. Henry, do you want to take that one first? You're on mute. Sorry, what exactly is meant by entitlements? 
for the, the BPS payments. Shall I pass it to Susan? Yeah, yes, I mean, it's been so, a reduction. I mean, yeah, the BPS is obviously reducing down, isn't it, and being replaced by um, other schemes. Yeah, I, th I think what we would expect to see. So, so entitlements can be traded, and I think it's that. I think the question is about yes. the market in entitlements, mm. and I, I think that that market will over time um, disappear. The value of entitlements will gradually reduce. Um, in line with the value of the payments that are going to be coming through and will eventually disappear. Now, I, I, how the market will operate in the short term, and particularly once delinking comes in in 2024, I imagine at that point that will be the, the end of the, the entitlement trading at that point. So there's effectively four years left of trading. But the, the, I understand that, they, that there will still be trading available until that point, but the value will obviously change. Yes, I, I think it was when it, the delinking was when I thought there would be a, a change. Uh, Cass Johnson was asking about delinking, uh, picking up from this, and do we have any further information about the reference years? And uh, then it gets a bit complicated about partnerships and reference amounts. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that. If, if I just pick that one up, we, we've done quite a lot of work in the CLA on delinking, um, partly because we thought that consultations were going to be coming out. We were ready for the consultation this time last year, I think, and obviously things have, things have uh, been delayed significantly because of COVID. Um, so that on, on delinking, uh, there's two parts of delinking. The, the simple one is where uh, delinking is going to happen in 2024, and that will mean that those in receipt of basic payments will no longer need to apply every year you'll just uh, get an agreement of what your remaining payments are going to be your remaining annual payments are going to be and you will you will receive those without having to apply or to continue to farm even so that's one that's the delinking of the payments the second bit is the lump sums now that is something um henry you might want to say a bit more about it but we understand that that's probably going to be available for a short period of time, possibly 2022, because obviously that will be more beneficial the earlier it, do, it is done in, in transition. So it's probably possibly only going to be available for one year. And this is rather than, I think the original concept had been that that would be available for anybody, even if you wanted to in, reinvest in your business, but it has now been narrowed down to just being an exit scheme. So it is, there will have conditions attached to it for those who are exiting the industry. So either selling up or letting out their land, for example, would, would be would constitute leaving um, leaving the industry and that may be uh, may be appealing for um, for people who are perhaps already thinking about what they're you know whether they want to continue in the industry and it might um, help make that decision about it, about that exit Henry do you have anything you want to add on that not really it is going to be available for a short limited period um, I think it opens in 20 22, but uh, I think we might have to check that, but uh, so, and it will be about, you know, obviously a condition of leaving. Um, so, yeah. And in so terms of the we, ref, oh, sorry, I was just going to say about the reference year, because that was the actual yeah. specific, there was a specific question right. on that one. Um, the reference years, there's two schools of thought. One is that you do an average of three years that are already passed, and that way the reference years, there's no sort of uh, chance of influencing what that might be. Um, the other school of thought is that you have a much narrower reference year as close to possible as the change, as close as possible to the change, which means that there's less problem, fewer problems of um, business change to deal with. Uh, at the moment, we are uh, the CLA view is that it should be a, a single a single year near to the point of change. Um, it's not like the changes in previous years where an average was more more required. There will always be businesses that will fall foul of whatever that period or one single year is. So the other important point is that there are there is an, an appeals uh, process for unusual situations because inevitably there will be business change um, voluntarily or not. You know, some you know, where, where there's probate and things like that might be working through now. Then um, that that cha those changes are already in process. So there would need to be um, procedures for those situations. I think that I, I, I would have to say to Henry that if he's particularly interested in new entrants, then he needs to make sure that this lump sum payment is as attractive as possible because helping people to retire with some dignity is the only way of 
are significantly opening up the industry. And so we've got a question here from Anthony Roberts asking, will the retiree have to vacate the farmhouse? And will he be able to hand the business over to his son or daughter or has it got to be a completely um, new entrant? I think all those things are um, to be determined. Um, so there will be um, a, a consultancy, a, a consultant and process to determine those things. Well, my understanding is that if the son and daughter are not in the partnership, if they're not in a family partnership, then it would be possible. But if they're already part of the family partnership, then it would not be possible for to take the lump sum to retire. So I think it will depend on the business, the, the level of level of involvement and financial involvement in the business as, as to whether they um, whether the, 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 the next generation can can benefit from it or that you can take the lump sum while passing on to the next generation. I think the other the other question about staying in the farmhouse, I think there's certainly a discussion around being able to stay in the farmhouse and even maybe keeping a small amount of land. So if you've got a diversified business, for example, that's run through the businesses, you might be able to keep stay in the farmhouse and run that business, but not farm. So it's very much the definitions are absolutely key on this. And um, the more it's like all these policy areas, when you start digging down into definitions and detail, it suddenly becomes a lot more complicated, what seems to have a, be a really good ambition. So it's an area that we're working on. And if, if you've got any um, any any points that are interested in the development of that, uh, please look out for our call for help when we're when the consultation arrives. And do we have a, uh, Francis Fitzherbert Brockholz is asking if we know when the consultation will, will actually start on the lump sum payment? I think it's due this quarter, um, the early part of this year. And I think it's, it's particularly, you know, there is a bit of a time imperative because if the policy is going to be brought uh, certainly the lump sums coming in in 2022, then it means the consultation needs to happen fairly quickly so that they can analyse the results and, and, and develop the policy and give people time to decide whether it's right for them or not. So 2022 is only um, 11 and a half months away. So it is really quite imperative that, that, that the consultation comes out soon. So we are expecting it fairly soon. We, we had been expecting it before Christmas. So I think it's, it, it, it is pretty much ready. It's just waiting on, on final approval and ensuring that the timing's right. And Henry, you might have more information than I have on that one. Sorry. I, I, I <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just so following on then from this lump sum idea and, and Henry's work on new entrants, um, I mean, what options is DEFRA considering in terms of encouraging new entrants? Well, the idea is to provide uh, a capacity, a support capacity for new entrants um, in terms of going from people who have ideas or uh, to actual um, concept businesses trialing and sort of implementing, but also supporting them in terms of accessing land, um, uh, <coughs> finance and so forth. But this is very much support so that rather than, uh, so funding a capacity, what, what the Secretary of State have called um, innovation hubs or incubation hubs uh, to support new entrants um, and effectively make them a less risky proposition in terms of being a tenant, in terms of uh, borrowing money uh, and so on, and meaning that they're more, they're likely to be more successful. And we're particularly looking to support new entrants who are, innovative, trying new ways of uh, uh, diversifying uh, new business models and so forth in the recognition that we have a challenge to uh, uh, farm in the future in a way that dramatically reduces environmental impacts and also uh, manages a much more risky uh, economic environment. So and Andrew Dickens was making the points, I've lost him now, I mean, about the huge amount of um, capital required to, uh, working capital required, if, if, if you go on to even a modest farm, a sort of 200 acres, you could well need over £100,000 to cover rent and seeds, fertiliser sprays, cultivation and things. I mean, it's, 
the, the sums are quite uh, beyond the reach of most potential new entrants. Well, that's why, you know, one of the key issues we have identified, but we're work working very closely with a range of people who, uh, you know, are very much involved in this area and, um, and they've been identifying the issues and obviously finance is one that we have uh, 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 clearly identified as a key issue. Uh, we are at the beginning of a process of co-design, so we don't have the answers yet, but uh, we, we, we recognise the, the, the challenge. Can I just, I think um, we need to be clear about what, we, what a new entrant is. And I think um, new entrants can mean lots of different things. And there are many new entrants into farming who come from other industries and have capital to invest. Um, new entrants aren't just people coming straight from university. Uh, quite often they might have been running a contractor business or they might have been building up their flock size uh, through, you know, rented land. So I think the new entrants are a very diverse group of people and I, I don't think we want to narrow that down too far and I think when you start thinking about all the different new entrants of all ages and all backgrounds who might want to come into farming and what they might bring that that sort of changes the the perspective a little bit I mean it, it doesn't change the fact that to get in to take on a tenanted farm you do need capital but um, it there are and, and there are but there are other also other ways of doing it uh, we're, we're currently doing some work it's at the, the agriculture productivity task force which is a joint industry and government initiative looking at how can we drive profitability and productivity within within farming um, that we're looking at some aspects of how we can encourage you know, uh, how the information that people need about different business structures for instance so things like share farming which is quite well established now but not many not being widely taken up but how that might operate in the future or things like um, you know franchise farming or community community farms lots of different ways that people can get involved uh, even if it's sort of a, a partnership in a small bit of the farm um, or a specific enterprise there are lots of different ways of doing things and not to be constrained by our current structures I think would be the message but that's an industry initiative that's going to be driving that and that you would expect to see other other information coming through on that at some point soon. And so just sort of wrapping up on this, uh, this sort of group of things, uh, Maddie Nash is asking about retirement and saying, is there likely to be just one option, i.e. the lump sum, or might there be different options for retiring farmers to choose from? I'm not sure, Susan. Um, I think at the moment, the option, it is a lump sum payment for, a, as far as what DEFRA, what DEFRA are looking at at the moment through the delinking program um, is the lump sum option. Uh, there, that doesn't stop people, it might not be right for everybody um, and there, there may well be other things that could be done. Uh, we're, we're currently looking at whether there might be tax, how the tax is treated for delinked lump sums, for example, for the lump sums is really important, but you know, whether the tax system can be used, but that's not, not going to be an easy change. So there are other ways that we can look to incentivize people who wish to retire to do it, to, to do it sooner rather than later maybe, but uh, they're all still in discussion. So I'm going right back to early on and John Robson was uh, slightly surprised, I think that, uh, 50% of the attendees have already made plans about losing their BPS and what they're going to do. He, and he's saying, how can they do that when they don't know what the benefits from ELMS will be? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I mean, I think this has been the charge that's been put back to DEFRA very frequently by us and others that there isn't enough detail to make really concrete plans for the future. I think you can make plans based on a number of assumptions and what, uh, and I think taking countryside stewardship would be a good basis for thinking about ELMS. I mean, clearly we're challenging government that countryside stewardship payments, which are based on income for gone and costs incurred, aren't always the most attractive. And we're arguing that the payments need to be attractive and you know a proper business arrangement with a profit element. But taking that as taking those as a starting point would give you some indication of what the what the payments for environmental land management scheme might be I mean, obviously there's some new areas where we don't know what the what payment rates might be and we're currently doing some work looking at the cost of delivery of those so that we have at least a baseline to to work from and I think that that's a, a, a point that it's worth 
you know, knowing and understanding your business costs and how much it might cost you to deliver some aspects will then allow you to make decisions about whether the offer coming through from ELM is the right one or not. So I think, you know, people, the people who are making plans, it would be great if we could have been able to get some of them on to speak, actually, but we, because this is such a large group, we can't do that. But it'd be really interesting to hear what they're saying. I imagine they have made some fairly, you know, sensible um, assumptions about what the future might might look like and, and based it on those. And that's, that's all that you can do at the moment. We are getting more information coming through. We're expecting when the, the ELM, the ELM pilot for the sustainable farming incentive comes through later uh, early, sometime in the spring we'll have a greater indication of what the payment rates might be for for those elements that are being piloted and brought in early and obviously by 2022 you'll have a bit of a view of what the payment rates will be for for sfi so i think there are there are some indications of what the payment rates will be but uh, you know i completely agree with you it is not easy to do when you haven't got concrete information and it's the confidence of the planning process that's difficult so we have a question from Hugh Fell about whether agroforestry will be included in the support in the future. I mean, my, my answer to this would be agroforestry is so popular at the moment that it would be astonishing if it wasn't included. But I think there's a, the issue about agroforestry is about the definition. And I think I'd like more clarity on the definition of what people mean by agroforestry. Do you agree, Susan? Yeah, absolutely. It means it's like a lot of things. It's it can be done in lots of different ways. Um, I think as a, a you know a broad definition of being fairly low dense density forest forestry that also allows other activities to go alongside it um, tends to be what, what we're looking at. And there there is a group looking at agroforestry being included in in ELM at the moment, and we would expect to see it in, in one shape, some shape or form, because clearly it's about the you know the benefits that the environmental benefits that that will deliver, and bringing in trees has uh, has got environmental benefits both for carbon sequestration and for biodiversity, um, so there will be benefits to that. So it's a question of how that then comes through into the payment scheme. So that, that is being worked on at the moment. So Phil Rowbottom is concerned that we're not giving enough emphasis to food production or food security, and I agree with him completely on that. But I think it's, uh, tied in with this is Tim Sedgwick asking about the Farm Investment Fund and what items we'd expect to be included. Just on the food security, I mean, I think a key element uh, from research that's been done at DEFRA is that uh, a lot of the work uh, on actual improving biodiversity, regeneration, etc., will have direct benefits for productivity as well. Um, you know, so uh, you know, in terms of a healthy ecological system, uh, you know, it tends to be a more productive one. So uh, I don't think for it, the the idea that there's some sort of an either or um, is it's that's certainly not how uh, Defra sees it. Um, the, the next one was what sort of things will be supported? Um, I think there, there are two strands of that farmer investment fund, one for smaller items and one for bigger items. Uh, I think that, you know, there will be a long list, uh, but, you know, it is the sort of equipment that farmers need. Uh, and obviously, you know, this is not new. Um, so there's a precedent to look at uh, to see what's been uh, supported in the past. So uh, moving quickly on, because I'm running out of time, uh, Guy Sampson and Samuel Richards would like a bit more information about sustainable farming incentive. Uh, shall, I, shall I start on that one, Henry? Yeah. Um, so the sustainable farming incentive is going to be based around a number of standards, which are basically packages of measures. So there's, I think there's going to be nine, I'm sorry, eight different, groups, so uh, the, uh, I won't be able to remember them all, but there's arable soils, arable land, grassland soils, grassland management, trees, hedgerows, the water environment, and heritage, uh, and there might be something else I've missed out. So each of those standards will be a group of measures that a group of actions that you will need to do all of them in order to meet that standard, and then you will be paid on that basis. Um, 
the, the, the standards are being developed at a pace and with input from, I'll just reassure you, with the input from um, real practitioners, so like yourselves, real farmers and landowners who are um, know what they're doing. We've we've organised quite a few um, workshops from with including members to go and to to put their in uh, to feed into that process, um, and it's rapidly rapidly developing. I would like to be able to say this is what it's going to be, but because what have what I have information I have yesterday is changing so much because they are working on it so quickly. But that's the broad picture that you will need to um, have you know comply. To, to get the payment, you will need to do a, a group of the, a, a group of measures and actions, and there will be three different levels. So they want the aim is that this will be accessible to everybody. So, but also that it's challenging and will move people to do more good things for the the environment and for the the land. So each of the standards will have different grades or different achievement levels. So uh, there will be a basic entry level and then there will be a more advanced level. I think the names haven't quite been agreed on what they're going to be called, but basically there'll be three different levels of those standards that you could go into depending on what you're already doing. So it allows people who are already delivering um, at, a, at certain things for the environment will we'll, we'll probably more likely to be able to achieve the, the advanced standard. So, and there'll be a higher payment rate for those ones. So it incentivizes more people to do more good things as well as um, having lots of options for people to uh, access it at any level. And I think the shape of it, to my mind, is, is looking reasonably good. It probably, my, my instinct to start with, and you'll all feel this when you first see it, is probably that it seems a little bit complicated, but that might be just the stage of the process of development that we're at. But it certainly will be, there'll be a lot of good things in there that a lot of you are already doing that you'll be able to say, yes, I do that already. And there'll be other things you might think, actually, I could just do that as well. And I will meet the standard. And Susan, Susan, can it work alongside existing stewardship agreements? Well, that's the debate at the moment. You can't get paid twice for the same thing. So, for example, the hedgerow standard, if you've already put your hedgerows into countryside stewardship, you won't also be able to do the countryside, you won't be able to do the sustainable farming incentive hedgerow standard, but you will have other standards such as the arable soils or the arable land that you will be able to, to go into because they don't overlap with countryside stewardship. And then I just one last question on a different subject about the Farm Resilience Programme. Liz Wilkinson is asking, what are the criteria for applying? How do you get onto the Farm Resilience Programme? Well, the Farm Resilience Programme is, is basically a sort of advice support service. <clears throat> um, I think it, it'll be available to um, all farmers. Um, it's not, uh, I mean, there's been a pilot uh, that's ending at the end of uh, March, and then the new scheme uh, will be starting um, soon after that. So there's a huge amount of activity going on to try and conclude from what the pilot is to get the sort of the actual fully blown scheme up and running as soon as possible in, in the new financial year. Um, so watch this space for uh, information very soon. Good. Uh, so we have uh, our last poll. Uh, so if you'd like to fill in what you think DEFRA should be prioritising, uh, that would be good. Uh, I'll give you a minute or two because there are quite a few options here. But while you're just doing that, uh, I would like to thank you for taking part in this webinar and I hope you found it useful and to re-emphasize what Susan said the CLA is here to to help you through this process uh, contact the regional office in the first place um, my team got quite a bit of expertise but we turn to Susan whenever things get a bit complicated so um, she'll be very happy to help as well so how are we getting on with the poll? Really? Uh, we're still getting some votes in, so... <laughs> 
Ah, uh, there will be a moment or two. I think it's going to be really interesting to see the results of this. <laughs> It's helpful to us, so we know what we know what we should be um, talking to Defra about. I think we're going to have to stop. If you're not voted yet, it's going to be too late. Right, yes, well, that's quite convincing. <laughs> um, some 40% uh, think that the most important thing is clarity on ELMS and the ELMS pilots. And then details, followed by about 20% on details of the sustainable farming incentive. So I think that's really helpful. Good, so um, a quick link for you here about some of the information that's available from the CLA. But as I say, just, just call the office. That's what we're here for. And I think that's probably brings us to the close of this afternoon's event. Oh yes, a quick plug here for something that we run in the North of England, Farm Update North uh, on Friday the 5th of February. Our guest speaker is Janet Hughes, who's the programme director for all this future farming and countryside stuff and she's excellent and so if, if you're free on Friday the 5th of February it'd be worth checking our website and booking on that event. Good so thank you again for taking part in the webinar. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>